Some conservative leadership hopefuls will be squaring off on the debate stage once again. This morning, the party tweeted, the eyes have it. Leoc is holding a third leadership debate thanks to the 24,000 members who responded to our survey, voting overwhelmingly at 65% for more action. Stay tuned for details. But frontrunner Pierre Polyev won't be there. His campaign released a statement saying the sole objective of the campaign now is to get new members and existing members to fill out their ballots and submit them before the September deadline. Pierre will be on the road again without interruption to make that happen. And Leslin Lewis has also just released a statement saying she has a packed schedule and quote, I am not convinced that a high level debate will cover new ground or be watched by many new members. So what could a third debate change if not everyone is actually there for it? Let's bring in the power panel to talk about that. Amanda Alvaro of Pomp and Circumstance is in Minette, Ontario. In Vancouver, former Conservative Cabinet Minister James Moore, now a senior advisor at Denton's. Andrew Thompson is Chief of Government Relations for the University of Toronto and a former Saskatchewan Finance Minister. He's in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario, and the Toronto Star's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Rob Benzie is here as well. Hi, everybody. Really good to see you. James, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, what is the sort of calculation, I guess, for the two candidates who are saying this is probably not worth it? And what does it do to the party's ability to hold that debate? I mean, I, I think they'll have to do a rethink. You know, Les and Lewis and Pierre Polyev are probably, um, you know, Les and Lewis is probably in third place, maybe second place. Pierre Polyev is the obviously prohibitive front runner. So, you know, if those two are not in the in, in the debate itself, then you have to wonder. There are rules in the party, of course. There's a fifty thousand dollar fine apparently that if you don't participate in a sanctioned Leoc debate, then then the campaigns will be fined in that regard. But look, I, I don't know of anybody who's who who is thinking of voting for Les and Lewis or Jean Charest or Roman Babe or Pierre Polyev, who says, I was going to vote for Pierre Polyev, but he didn't show up to that fourth debate. He's lost my vote. <laughs> I don't think that I don't think that voter exists. And I think that's the calculus. And look, you know, ballots have already gone out. I suspect more than a quarter, maybe a third of people who've received their ballots, maybe more have already voted. Um, so I, I don't know that the debate serves a great uh, purpose at this point. So um, Leoc may reevaluate their decision to hold this or maybe just find the candidates. But there's also a cost of putting on the debate itself. Yeah. So I, I think it's I think if, if I were in Pierre Polyev's shoes, I think I would be taking a pass on this as well. It's interesting, Andrew, because in my conversations in the past month with people from the party who are involved with Leo, for example, and in this decision, they did not seem to be leaning towards the idea of having a, a third debate. So when I saw that this morning, I was I, I was a mm -hmm. bit surprised. Uh, why do you think they they went ahead with that idea? Well, it seems like they've trapped themselves into this uh, you know, poll that they did, this uh, membership uh, survey, which was surprisingly uh, tepid in terms of its result. But I find it very um, curious that Pierre Pelliev would turn down the opportunity to, to participate in the debate. He's obviously the presumed front runner. No, he's probably not going to sway any votes at this point. But the opportunity for him to present himself as a leader that can unite what seems to be a party that is not only fracturing but falling apart uh, seems to me to be a missed opportunity. The opportunity that he would have to stand in front of Canadians again, sure he can stick to a script that's not full of a whole bunch of crazy conspiracy theories, present himself as a prime minister, would seem to be the opportunity here. It's a chance for him to move beyond just being partisan to start looking like he's actually a leader of the party. So I'm not entirely sure why that he would pass this up. Uh, and in the process, may I say that the, you know, the the note that they put out practically set the uh, the Leoc and the party on fire. <laughs> I mean, it was just uh, unbelievable. Uh, I haven't seen an attack like that on one's own party from a potential leader in a long time. Well, the uh, the other interesting part of the, the statement that was put out, Amanda, was, and, and it sort of, you know, is through Jenny Byrne, who's running the campaign, one of the people mm -hmm. running the campaign through her account, was also around that the focus is right now get out the vote. And if you know of right. sort of Jenny Byrne, you know that that is something that she is very uh, in tune with, right? Like, that's a big deal, uh, and she's known to be pretty good at getting out the vote. So it, that part doesn't mm -hmm. surprise me either. No, but it was snarky 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 the the statement that was put out by the polyev campaign you know just the tone of it like the use of the word stupid and throwing everybody under the bus and you extrapolate and you think of like the tone of his campaign and what he's going to bring as leaders it's kind of scary territory but that aside 
I think the calculus is usually, you know, if you put a front runner in front of a debate format, it's going to be the anybody but format and they're under attack and they spend the entire hour, 90 minutes um, fully under attack, fully having to defend themselves. Now, he's not the kind of candidate who's usually put off by something like that. He tends to do really well, even in like hot button scenarios. So it was somewhat surprising to me, especially because the way that it was framed by Leoc was that this was a survey that went out to members, and it was the members who were requesting this third debate. Seems to me that, well, a tiny opportunity, it does present a bit of an opportunity for the other candidates to talk about the fact that already Polyev is turning his back on what the party membership is look, really looking forward to, and that's debating some of these ideas and deciding what this Conservative Party is going to stand for. Yeah, that's part of it. My guess is, though, that the number of members, which I think was about 10 percent of over the overall mm -hmm. total that signed up, was, you know, I guess perceived. I, I can infer maybe it perceived to be not of huge significance from from the campaign. Uh, Rob, I'll quickly read just a little bit of the, um, for example, of, of what everyone's referring to in this statement. Pierre Polyev participated in two debates as well as the Canada Strong and Free Network debate in Ottawa. It was not the campaign's fault that the party's Edmonton debate was widely recognized as an embarrassment. That's the, just the opening line of, of, of the statement and mm -hmm. it goes into some more details of it. Your thoughts on how this is playing out? I agree with Amanda. I was struck by the snarky tone. I understand him not wanting to do a debate. I don't blame him. I wouldn't do it either. He's got everything to lose and nothing to gain because he's probably going to win uh, and could even win on the first ballot. And I, I just think that the tone of it suggests that they're still playing campus politics. And I don't know why these guys mm -hmm. can't switch to another gear and start to try to win the country. They're still talking to Con convoy loving Jordan Peterson podcast crypto bros instead of like moving totally. to my mom and people like that who are switch voters, you know, liberal Tory switch voters, like try to start thinking how you're going to win the 70 seats in Ontario that you're going to need to win to be prime minister of Canada. Uh, instead, he's still going down this weird narrow cast thing like talking about Tom Clark as a Laurentian elite, which no one, no one uses the term Laurentian elite. Like, I don't, I don't know anyone other than a few <laughs> journalists who are themselves Laurentian elitists who use that term. So it's so weird to deride my friend Clark like that when Pierre Polyev has been an MP since uh, I was about 17. I mean, he's, a, he's, a, he's himself a Laurentian elite from planet Ottawa, for God's sake. So I thought it was a very odd kind of tone. Again, I don't blame them, but I also think, man, at some point, when are you going to pivot to starting to look like a statesman, looking like the leader, potential leader of a G7 country. I feel like... Imagine, he's a yeah, he's a James, hold on, I'll just get you in. Wait, I, 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 sir, you guys can't all talk over each other because we're still on Skype and it doesn't work that way. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, I feel like, James, that a statement like this is, in their minds, going to prompt a conversation like the one that's being had, and that's what they would expect, and, the, mm -hmm. and then they'll just say, look at all the Laurentian elites rolling their eyes at us, and, and that will further support people, you know, drive support among people who support them. I don't know. What do you think? Who knows? Maybe this very conversation will get clipped somewhere as a proof, right? So, <laughs> like, um, but look, you know, Pierre Polyev, you haven't won the leadership until you've won the leadership. He's had the same tone and same approach vis-a-vis -vis his opponents from the beginning of this campaign through until the end. And I think it served him pretty well. 300, 300, over 310,000 new members signed up. The party is in first place in the polls, I think, by consensus, by a couple of points. If an election were held today, the Conservative Party would do very well. And Pierre Polyev has gone for, like, if there's ever been a campaign that has lived up to the slogan of, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win, it's the Pierre Polyev campaign. He signed up mm -hmm. 310,000 people with this approach. He's had his message track. And the reason why people in the Conservative Party like the way that Pierre comes into politics with elbows up, it's not because they necessarily want Jean Charest to be attacked or Patrick Brown to be, to be punched up. It's because they see it as a proxy for how Pierre Polyev will take on Justin Trudeau, and that does get Conservatives very excited. So before people start second-guessing how Pierre's approached this campaign, I think history will show that this has been one of the most successful leadership campaigns in modern Canadian politics. Andrew, I'll get you to give us the final word because I, I know you wanted to jump in. I just quickly want to say I just got in my inbox a statement from Jean Charest's campaign about the decision from Mr. Polyev to not participate. I'll just read a tiny bit of it. Uh, uh, Jean has never shied away, the statement says, from answering tough questions, whether from the media or party members. And we would expect anyone who's vying to lead the Conservative Party of Canada to act in a respectful and responsible manner. Sorry for looking at my phone, everyone. To refrain from a debate is disrespectful mm -hmm. to party leadership and its 675,000 members. That's just a, a statement from the Charest campaign on uh, the Polyev decision not to participate. Uh, last word to you, Andrew. 
Well, I will say that I, I do think uh, Polyev's uh, uh, assessment of the first debate was bang on. Couldn't have said it better myself, uh, even if I might not have said the Laurentian elite part. But I mean, it was pretty much a gong show. But you would have assumed they'd want to do over on that. Not entirely sure I agree with James that, you know, Polyev's man, uh, you know, taking his uh, cues from Gandhi in terms of how to run this campaign. But, uh, you know, it's an interesting <laughs> perspective, nevertheless. Okay, I'm going to pause it there. We've got more Power Panel ahead. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.